Student Dr. Kylie Limbach previously went to Central Methodist University and received a Bachelor of Science in Biology. Um, she's currently undecided in specialty, but is interested in radiology and orthopedic surgery. So I will hand it over to you, Kylie. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Student Dr. Limbach. I'm currently an anatomy fellow this year on the Casey campus. And this is my research project, Danger Zone for Paramean and Forehead Flap Elevation, Maximizing Flap Length and Viability. So let's just start with a brief overview of the anatomy for anyone who might not be aware of the supertrochlear artery anatomy. So first, the supertrochlear artery is a branch of the ophthalmic artery, the first branch off the internal carotid artery. The supertrochlear artery travels through the supraorbital margin, either through the supertrochlear foramen or a supertrochlear notch. The supertrochlear artery supplies blood to the forehead and scalp and contributes to a scalp anastomosis with the supraorbital artery. It's also important to note that the supraorbital supertrochlear artery changes tissue planes as it ascends the forehead, and this is particularly important for my research. So first, in the bottom third of the forehead, the supertrochlear artery travels above the periosteum. Then in the middle third of the forehead, the supertrochlear artery travels within the frontalis muscle, and you can see that here in this image. And then in the top third of the forehead, the supertrochlear artery travels within the subcutaneous fat. So now for just a brief overview of paramedian forehead flaps. So first, uh, paramedian forehead flaps are usually used for facial defect reconstruction. Typically, this is done when a like skin cancer on the nose is removed, and that creates a defect. So first here, you can see in this image, a uh, defect from uh, possibly skin cancer, and then the surgeon creates clear margins around the skin cancer. This next step is pretty important for creating a very good paramedian forehead flap. You use something typically gauze is used to reconstruct how long your paramedian forehead flap needs to be. So then the surgeon uh, turns this on its pedicle to see how long exactly this flap needs to be on the patient. And once you make a marker to outline your flap, you can then cut your flap and then locate this new created flap on its pedicle to see if it does indeed reach the defect you're trying to fix. And then of course, you can uh, bring the margins of the cut you made together and suture it. And then uh, the pedicle division is performed three weeks postoperatively to allow sufficient neovascularization. Surgeons should consider flap thinning and sculpting as well as a cartilage graft at this point. So why is all of this important? The supertrochlear artery demonstrates clinically relevant anatomical variability that impacts the utilization and success of facial reconstruction with a paramedian forehead flap. Surgical parameters, including banting pattern variations of the supertrochlear artery, as well as the dis distance of the supertrochlear artery to the midline have been well established. And some of the most common uh, supertrochlear artery variations are available in this picture. However, the location and variability of the supertrochlear artery pedicle has not adequately been described in the literature to date. In this study, we aim to triangulate the location of the supertrochlear artery pedicle relative to known anatomical landmarks and outline a danger zone during dissection, which aids the surgeon in creating maximum flap length and mobility while limiting pedicle disruption and flap compromise. So how do we do this? First, we created a tissue flap with a scalpel and then used a special tool that you can see here on the screen called a freer elevator, which lifts the periosteum off the bone to best locate the supertrochlear artery pedicle. To triangulate a danger zone surrounding the supertrochlear artery pedicle, four measurements were taken using a digital caliber. And all measurements were taken by the principal investigator to ensure validity and consistency in the measuring method. So our first me our measurements included first, midline to supertrochlear artery pedicle, a standard which has previously been described as 1.7 to 2.2 centimeters, which served as our control. Next, the supraorbital neurovascular bundle to supertrochlear pedicle, then bony orbital rim to supertrochlear artery pedicle, and finally, the medial canthus, the supertrochlear artery pedicle. These measurements were obtained bilaterally on 38 cadavers at the Kansas City University, as well as the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Data was tallied in Excel and statistically analyzed. And I would just like to put a disclaimer right here. I'm about to show cadaveric images and not only just of a cadaver, but they're of the face. So please be aware if that will make you uncomfortable. 
So here you can see in this left image, uh, the paramedian forehead flap outline. We created this on all the cadavers before cutting to make sure we had a single standard to start from. So first, the black marker is the facial midline, and then the blue marker is 1.7 centimeters away from this midline, which marks the average supertrochlear artery location. We then measured 0.07 on both sides of the blue marker to create the typical width of the paramedian forehead flap used for the surgery. And finally, this green marker over here is 2.7 centimeters from midline, marking the average supraorbital neurovascular bundle area, because I wanted to make sure not to cut through that since I was measuring from it. On the right side, you can see uh, a paramedian forehead flap creation after my dissection. So as I stated earlier in this presentation, knowing how the supertrochlear artery changes tissue planes is important for this research. So here in the inferior one third of the forehead, the supertrochlear artery runs along the periosteum. And this little black mark is where I found the supertrochlear artery pedicle. Then in the middle of one third of the forehead, the supertrochlear artery is located in the frontalis muscle. And you can see the skeletal muscle striations here. And then in the superior one third of the forehead, the supertrochlear artery is located in the subcutaneous fat. Um, and this slide is just an example of some of how we did the measuring. So here on the left, it's the midline to the location of the supertrochlear artery pedicle, which is once again, that little black dot. And then here on the right, we're doing medial canthus, which is essentially just the inner eye to the supertrochlear artery pedicle. So for our results, the means and range of each measurement were used to create a surgical dissection danger zone. The measurement means and standard deviations were as follows. Facial midline to pedicle is 1.69 centimeters plus or minus 1.4 with a range of 1.3 to 2 centimeters. Superorbital neurovascular bundle to pedicle was 1.5 centimeters plus or minus 0.37 with a range of 0.6 to 2.7 centimeters. Orbital rim to pedicle was 1.353 centimeters plus or minus 0.38 with a range of 0.6 to 2.2 centimeters. And finally, the medial canthus to pedicle was 3.05 centimeters plus or minus 0.37 with a range of 2.3 to 3.8 centimeters. Of the 38 cadavers utilized for the study, 20 were male and 18 were female. And 35 of the specimens were from embalmed cadavers and the remaining three were from fresh cadavers. And no significant differences were found between right-sided and left-sided measurements with a P greater than 0.5. So why is all this important? Firstly, preserving the supertrochlear artery pedicle is vital to creating a viable tissue flap for a variety of facial procedures. Vascular disturbances of the supertrochlear pedicle may disrupt blood flow to the constructed tissue flap. This complication may lead to ischemia of the tissue flap and result in flap failure. Additionally, maximum flap mobility can be paramount to reach difficult defects, such as the nasal tip and camella. And precise isolation of the pedicle from known landmarks may help surgeons maximize flap length while still preserving blood supply and maintaining flap viability. So here you can see in this uh, drawing I created the surgical dissection danger zone that we created with this being the midline mark, medial canthus, um, um, bony orbital rim, and your superorbital neurovascular bundle. So this study has established a surgical dissection danger zone for the supertrochlear artery pedicle as it relates to the elevation and creation of a paramedium forehead flap. Using these measurements, the facial reconstruction surgeon can prevent pedicle violation while maximizing flap length and mobility to optimize safety and efficacy in this operation. So I would like to end by thanking first Dr. Sirk and student Dr. Kendall for helping me prepare and perform my cadaveric dissections. I would also like to thank Dr. Dennis for helping me with all the pa uh, paperwork and the research procedures. That was a lot since this is one of my first research projects. And finally, a great thank you to all the donors and their families for their great contribution. Without the KCU gift body program, I would not have been able to do this cadaveric research. And here are my references. And does anyone have any questions? Questions for Kylie. Okay, get one back there. Hi, Kylie. Thank you for your presentation. So my question is, if the forehead flap is not a good fit for the facial reconstruction surgery that is needed, is there a secondary location that is used instead? 
Um, if you fail in making, for instance, the flap long enough and it won't reach the defect, you'll have to graft from a different area of the body, um, like typically the leg, I believe. Thank you. I have a quick question about your, your measurements, and it seemed like some of these measurements had a pretty big uh, range, mm -hmm. smallest to largest. How do you then create a recommendation for the surgeon out of that? There would be, if you took the minimum, that's probably the safest, but that might not allow uh, a flap of the size you need. And if you take the largest, might be too, um, uh, too restrictive. And if you just take the average, obviously <laughs> the problem there. So how do you make, uh, come to your conclusion then? How did you resolve that problem? Uh, for the measurements, the one with the greatest range was the medial canthus, um, which varied largely in male versus females, which you can typically see by just like the length of the skull. Um, so when you're looking at these measurements in the dissection danger zone, it's important to take all your patient information. Um, and then also we could possibly look for it in a different uh, future study using something besides the medial canthus since it did have such variation. We've got another question here from Kansas City. Hello, this is more like a general question for all the people who've worked with cadavers. I don't know if you're able to tell us a little bit more about the KCU GIF like donor program because um, I've noticed like the demographics are very similar in all the groups and so I was wondering if I don't know how you can diversify the, the subjects or so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so the KCU GIF body program usually uses uh, donations from a local area um, so that is part of the demographic issue but um, in some years, there are shortages of body donations in which for, we have to like uh, import cadavers from different states, and we could do a better job at picking demographics that we are missing, I believe, when we do have to import, but otherwise they are from local areas. If, um, if you want to know more about the cadaver program here, we can put you in touch with, just let me know, we can put you in touch with whoever is managing that. Mm -hmm. There's also, also like a gift body program uh, event at the end of the year to thank all the donors and their families. And there's lots of information at that. Uh, let's see, I see another question here from Kansas City. Hello, I'm sure it probably uh, varies quite a bit on the incision and how big that it is. But what's the typical recovery time for like a healthy individual who, you know, doesn't smoke, is active, um, that sort of thing? Um, that varies greatly based on the person's age and also the length of the defect. So nasal tip requires a much larger flap that takes longer to heal. Um, you also have to incorporate uh, how long it takes to reconstruct. So some plastic surgeons who usually do the surgery are a little more experienced than others because it's not just moving the flap down and leaving it. You do eventually dissect the flap and incorporate that new tissue into the existing tissue on your nose. Thank you. Hi, I have one more question. <laughs> what are the risks involved in dissecting the tissue from the forehead flap versus other areas of the body when you're working with um, like a live patient that is needing facial reconstruction surgery? Yeah, so part of the reason people like to use the forehead flap when uh, fixing nose defects is because you can keep the blood supply intact while rotating it on its pedicle. Whereas if you use a graft from a different portion of the body, you have to reconnect it to the existing blood supply in the nose. So that allows the tissue to become a little bit more part of the nose tissue naturally before you dissect off that blood supply and reconnect it to the nose's blood supply. So some of the risks involved with that is how well uh, you rotate the tissue flap, which is part of the reason that I did this experience or experience. So you could see where the pedicle was, because if you coil, the artery too hard around the pedicle, the tissue flap will die. So that's a major risk factor. Thank you. Okay, one more from here in Kansas City. Hi, Kylie. Um, great presentation. Is there currently, um, during this flap procedure prior to, is there some sort of imaging that is involved um, that kind of tries to map out the, the vasculature prior to? Currently, there's no imaging done. Uh, just using the measurements like 
knowing from midline, the supratrochlear artery is 1.7 centimeters. It's basically what all uh, surgeons have been going off of, which is part of the reason I wanted to have this research to add to that knowledge base. Okay, thank you, Kylie, for a really interesting presentation. Thank you all.